So here, well, here's that solution. It's worked out. So we got to this step right here. If we go through this and we find the magnitude, how do we find the magnitude of a, this? Also, if you think about it, what does this really look like? Well, yeah, it's a function of omega, but it's it's a number. It's not a voltage or a current, really. It's just a number right now. Um, so that transfer function, I can find its magnitude, just like I found the magnitude of impedances and magnitude of voltages by multiplying by its complex conjugate and taking the square root, right? So if I took this and I, and I changed this to a minus sign, so it was one over one minus j omega rc, multiply it together, take the square root, I'll get the magnitude, and it comes out like this. And the nice thing about that is the magnitude doesn't have any j's left. That's why you take the complex conjugate. It cancels all your j's. So when we find that, we find that, in fact, now, here we have an omega naught, which didn't appear here. But if you remember back to RC circuits, we defined a tau, which was just RC. So we typically called the time constant, you know, that was how we defined RC circuits. And so now we could just say generically, if that's a time constant, RC, then one over that would be a natural frequency, omega naught. And so, and which is what we've defined down here. One over RC is omega naught. So we have a magnitude, and I can plot that now as a function of omega. And when I plot it, I get a response that looks like this. Right? This response tells me, for an input that comes in, what do I get out the other side? At low frequencies, when omega is zero, DC, right? how does my circuit respond? Well, when omega is DC, I have a one. So whatever thing I put in is what I get out. Does that make sense for the RC circuit? If I put in five volts here and it's DC, what's the voltage across the capacitor? Think about it, DC analysis, what does a capacitor look like? Open. Yeah, so a capacitor is an open circuit. So if this was a DC circuit, and I redrew it, and I said I have just a five volt input here, phase of zero, it's fine. And there's a resistor, and then the capacitor, when omega is zero, looks like it's open, what's the voltage across that? Five volts. Five volts, right? There's no current flowing because there's not a closed circuit, so there's no voltage drop across this resistor arm. And so the voltage out equals the voltage in, which means H must be 1. And our magnitude plot tells us that. Yes, it is. Right? It also tells us what the phase shift is. So when omega is 0, the phase shift is 0. Again, this is a phase of 0. When it comes out over here, I expect it to be a phase of 0. So it's 5 volts phase of 0. It's just that. And that worked. Right? So this relates right back to everything we've already looked at. It's just we don't have to know omega ahead of time. The nice thing is that now we can actually see what happens as we change omega. So think about the other extreme. When omega is very, very high, capacitors look like a short. short. Yeah. So if it's a short circuit, how much current flows through the capacitor? Or well, how much voltage is across the capacitor? If this becomes a short. What's the voltage? Zero, right, because there can't be a voltage across a short circuit. And sure enough, H is very, very close to zero. As omega gets to infinity, it truly does become, you know, it asymptotically approaches zero. So that seems to work, yes, right? But then there's this other piece of it, the phase shift, which we haven't really explored quite as much, right? But in fact, at high frequencies, this, equation here, if we find the phase portion, and remember phase is the arc tangent of the imaginary part of H divided by the real part of H. So if I took this and I took just the, you know, and I separated it out into two pieces, real and imaginary, then I would take the imaginary over the real and it actually works out to be the arc tangent of omega over omega naught. It, it does simplify pretty nicely. And so in that case, we see as omega gets really, really, really high, arc tangent of infinity, which approaches, or negative arc tangent of infinity, 
and it approaches negative 90 degrees in phase shift. So we can see both the magnitude and the phase response. And that's how we typically characterize anything where we're using a transfer function. Um, depending on the application, you may find that one or the other of these two sort of dominates the response you actually see. Certain things in real life are not very phase dependent. So they don't really care about the angle of the sine wave coming in, right? Other things are not very magnitude dependent. So a couple of good examples are our senses. Ears, when we listen to music, what's the thing we always change, the knob that we turn? Volume, amplitude, magnitude. Our ears are very sensitive to changes in amplitude. We can very easily distinguish if something is soft or something is loud, right? Our ears are mag more magnitude sensitive. It requires a huge phase shift, relatively speaking, before our ears start to distinguish some distortion. And so amplifiers who, that are for audio applications focus more on making clean magnitude amplifications. A little bit of phase shift might be okay. You don't want to go too crazy because it'll also it will interfere. But then the opposite is true of our eyes. And you say, well, what happened? How is that possible? Right? Well, think about if you look at a picture. Can you tell very much if I have, you know, two squares right next to each other? If this square is a little bit lighter than that square, do you notice it very much? Like if one pixel is a little bit dimmer than another pixel, you're not gonna really Hell. You know, you might notice if you look really carefully at it, but it's not as big of a deal as if this goes from, say, you know, green to black, right? Or if there's a like a black line across the screen. Or even more so if you're thinking about a picture, what if the pieces of your frame shifted just a little bit, right? To where if this is a smiley face, it's really useless. It's like, it, it's like I don't even have an eraser in my hand. <laughs> it's just, it's the same. Anyway, so okay, so if I had a smiley face, right, and I had a phase shift in the image, which might mean one piece shifts a little bit. So now Mr. Smiley Face looks like this. Can you notice that? Hmm? It looks creepy. It looks a little creepy. That's right. Yes, it does. <laughs> Half his face is sort of sliding off, right? Right. We are, so our eyes are really attuned to phase shifts, to contrast differences, right? If things don't quite line up right, we notice. Because our eyes are trying to detect you know, edges, shapes, those sorts of things. Whether it's light or dark outside, right? We still need to see a shape. We don't really need to see how bright it is. We just need to know it's there, right? So our eyes, while they are sensitive to magnitude, are extremely sensitive to phase in a different way than our ears, right? So, you know, these two things, again, if you were building then a video amplifier, you'd want to make darn sure that your phase lined everything up right. right. So a little bit of a different consideration based on the real application you're looking for. So we can do the same, again, very simple application, an RL circuit, right? Can we find the transfer function for this one? So let's just, again, we would follow a very similar type of analysis, right? Do KVL around the loop, minus VS, plus RI, plus now L becomes J omega L in the phaser domain, right? In the impedance form. So it would be j omega L times I, and then in the end, V out is j omega L times I. That's our output voltage. So if I were to do that, right, and find then, divide the Vs over, I get the transfer function. It looks like this j omega L over R plus j omega L. We clean it up a little bit just to get a one on the top. We don't want j's floating all over the place if we can avoid it, right? 
And so we're able to get all the J's in here, and then we can make a shift in this bottom piece. Um, now the R over L reminds us of the tau that we're used to looking for in our RL circuits, right? So it puts it back in some terms. This is not wrong, not at all. It's just algebra. And as you, again, as we, you move further along, you'll be less and less concerned probably about the final form your transfer function takes. Because in the end, um, there are sort of three general ways you write transfer functions down, depending on what you're trying to do with it. And so in the end, you let it just be a purely mathematical construct. And you don't try to look very much for the little, you know, oh, an R over L, that looks like a tau. I recognize that. You're just going to put all the numbers in, and you're going to you know, let, let the math do its job, and you look at the output. Right? So, but for now, it's kind of nice to show that this does relate back to things that we're used to. And so in this case, again, we would find the magnitude and the phase. And when we find the magnitude in this case, notice that the omega naught is on top of the omega. So when I plot that as a function of omega, it does something completely different. Right? At DC, there's no voltage. Well, what does the inductor look like in DC? Sure. Yeah. So sure enough, it obeys everything we've done before. But then again, the inductor at high frequency looks like an? No, we already used short. Open. So it's open. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So if it's not an open, if it's not a short, it's an open. Right. So if it's an open circuit at high frequencies, well, that's kind of like the RC circuit for DC. If it's an open circuit, that voltage just appears across the inductor. And so we have a 1. So we vary from a 0 to a 1. But high frequencies are what get a one. So I didn't call it that on the on the previous slide, right? This is a high pass filter. So you may have heard the terminology high pass or low pass or band pass filters. That's where it comes from. When you look at the transfer function, you actually get to see what frequencies get through. In other words, for what frequencies is H1, right? Meaning whatever I put in comes out the other side. And so in this case, high frequencies go right through. So RL circuits are high pass filters. So that's, again, as you move forward into your electronics design courses next year, you're going to start to say, all right, I need a high pass filter. You're going to say you need a high pass filter. And then you say, well, how do I make one? Oh, well, I remember RL circuits make high pass filters. Right? So we'll start to talk about things, again, more as transfer functions, filters, gains, things like that. Less as, oh, there's a capacitor here, there's a resistor there. Why? Because as we move forward, we want to design. We want to be engineers. We've spent a lot of time this year really doing analysis, which is someone else put the circuit on the page for us, and we need to figure out what that circuit's doing. But now, if we're going to start to say, well, I want to make something that does this, I have to talk about the function. And then I fit the blocks in. So if I, for example, I'm making my audio amplifier, and I know I need no frequencies over 20,000 hertz because I can't hear them, I might put in a low pass filter. That makes sure, though, that the frequency, this is often called this omega naught, is typically called the corner frequency or the cutoff frequency. And that corner or cutoff frequency ought to be 20,000 hertz. And then they, it's, it's defined as various things. It's defined that it's basically the half power point. And if I put that in, half of my power will get through. Below that, we figure it's actually be, really being filtered out and cut off, right? If I'm not even getting half of my power through. But as long as I'm getting half of my power or more, I figure, well, my, my filter or my gain is pretty good for that frequency. So RC circuits are low pass filters, RL circuits are high pass filters, and we can combine them and we can make different versions um, to get band pass filters or band stop filters or a whole variety of things. And we will start to piece those together. Now all of these are considered passive filters, right? Because passive filters are using just passive components, resistors and inductors and capacitors. 
there's a whole nother discussion, which we'll talk about later, on active filters, where you use an op amp. So you can actually amplify things, and you can tune the frequency, and you can keep your gain up at one or above much easier. Right? Passive filters, you can't add anything in, so all you can do is go from one down, because they don't put any energy back into the circuit. Op amps can't, so you can get a little fancier. Okay. 